Hello, this is Akram Jafar, and in this session, I'm going to deal with the histology of the urinary system. The urinary system consists of kidneys, ureters, urinary bladder, and the urethra. So we are going to start with the kidney. The functional unit of the kidney is the nephron, and uh, there are about 1 million nephrons per kidney, and they are composed of uh, a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule. The renal corpuscle consists of a glomerulus, which is a tuft of capillaries, where filtration takes place. And then there is the glomerular, or the Bowman's capsule, which is like a cup with a double layer, a visceral layer, inner layer, that surrounds the glomerulus, and an outer layer. And between them there is a space. If you recall, the function of the kidney is that it regulates the composition of blood, including the uh, ions, including the blood pH, uh, osmolarity, glucose, and also it regulates the blood volume, regulates the blood pressure, and uh, produces some hormones, excretes, wastes. So the structure of the nephron will allow to do this. So as I said, that filtration will take place in the renal corpuscle, but then the reabsorption and excretion will take place in the renal tubule, and this is formed of a proximal part, proximal to the renal corpuscle, and it is folded on itself, this blue one here, and that's why it's called the proximal convoluted tubule. And then it gives rise to a U-shaped loop, which is called the loop of Henle, and this is formed of two parts, a descending part and an ascending part, and each one of them can be formed of a thick part and a thin part. And then there is the distal convoluted tubule, so it might look as if it is very close to the glomerulus, but it is actually, it is the distal part of the tubule, and it is also folded on itself, and so it's called the distal convoluted tubule, as opposed to the proximal convoluted tubule, and then we have the collecting ducts, which will continue down into the renal medulla. This is the region of the renal medulla, and open at the tip of the pyramid which is the uh, uh, shape of the re uh, parts of the renal medulla. You can see here that the tip of the pyramid is called the renal papilla, and there are multiple openings here for the um, collecting ducts that will give rise to what we call the papillary ducts. So, as you can see from this simple diagram, that the medulla contains mainly, it contains the collecting ducts, the papillary ducts, and contains also the descending and ascending parts of the loop of Henle. But the cortex of the kidney, the outer part of the kidney, it also contains the renal corpuscle. Renal corpuscles cannot be present in the medulla, so as the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule, they are only present in the cortex. But we can still see parts of the loop of Henle, we can still see the collecting ducts in the cortex, especially the parts of the cortex uh, which are present between the medullary pyramids and are called the medullary rays. I will talk about this in a moment. Now let's look at a slide of a renal corpuscle and you will find here that this is the glomerulus. It is surrounded by the cup-shaped Bowman's capsule. It's not very clear here as in the diagram but I can still see that this is the outer layer of the capsule, the parietal layer. The inner layer is directly covering the uh, glomerulus. This is the visceral layer. And between them, there is a, a space due to shrinkage of the glomerulus that usually takes place during tissue preparation. Uh, this space looks a little bit big. So what happens in the glomerulus is that there is an afferent arteriole and this artery will give rise to a network or a tuft of capillaries which constitute the glomerulus surrounded by the gut. And then we have an efferent arteriole, not a venule. Here there is another arteriole, which is an efferent arteriole, which, because it's going to give rise to another group of uh, capillaries that uh, will form what we call the vasa recta around the uh, loop of Henle. So there is an afferent arteriole and an efferent arteriole. And you can see it here uh, in this diagram that the afferent arteriole is wider than the efferent arteriole. So there is more blood uh, coming 
into the glomerulus than the blood leaving in the glomerulus and this will result in the fact that the pressure of blood in the glomerulus and the capillaries of the glom glomerulus is high and this pressure of blood will create the force that will cause filtration of blood of the components of the blood so the blood will get filtered here there is no diffusion this is filtration and it is driven by the pressure the reason for the high pressure is that the afferent arteriole is wider than the efferent arteriole and you can see that the glomerulus here it has a, what we call a vascular pole where the afferent and efferent arterioles pass in and out so this is the vascular pole and there is another pole here which is called the urinary pole where the filtrate is going to reach the first part of the tubule that is the proximal convoluted tubule and in the slide here you can see the glomerulus it is surrounded by multiple profiles of ducts these ducts not this one these ducts are the proximal and distal convoluted tubules this is another view of the renal corpuscle it will show you that the outer layer the parietal layer of the bowman's capsule is formed of simple squamous epithelial cells you can see the flattened nuclei of the simple squamous epithelial cells again you can see the space and then the visceral layer is directly applied to the capillaries of the glomerulus so you can see here in the region of the glomerulus there are a lot of nuclei and these nuclei belong to several types of cells first of all it belongs to the capillary endothelial cells uh, these will be like flattened nuclei and the second type of cells are called the mesangial cells in this stain we cannot show the difference this is a conventional stain we cannot show the difference between them but these they are present the mesangial cells are present and these are the supporting cells it's like the connective tissue what we call the mesangium of the glomerulus and the third type of cells are the what we call the podocytes in fact these podocytes are the cells of the visceral layer of the bowman's capsule so what does it mean podocytes so this is a podocyte a podocyte podo means that it has pedicles it has feet it has multiple feet and these podocytes uh, they have primary and secondary processes so the primary processes are big and the secondary processes are small and they interdigitate with each other and they leave a very small space between the adjacent cells these are called the slit pores and as you can see that these podocytes they this is the nucleus of the podocyte they wrap around the capillaries of the this is a capillary they wrap around the capillaries of the glomerulus and the podocytes will form part of what we call the filtration membrane you can see parts of the filtration membrane in this diagram the first part is this one and this is these are the fenestrations or the pores of the glomerular endothelial cells you will recall that the capillaries can be fenestrated or non-fenestrated but the fenestrated capillaries are required where there is a lot of exchange of substances between the blood and the uh, interstitial tissue so these capillaries of the glomerulus they are all fenestrated and uh, these fenestrations are large enough to allow um, filtration of all components of the blood in fact uh, except the uh, blood cells and then the second part of the filtration membrane is this what we call the basement membrane of the endothelial cells and uh, they uh, prevent the filtration of uh, large protein molecules and then the third part which i have just mentioned here these are the slit pores um, between the processes of the podocytes between the secondary processes of the podocytes and um, they produce what is called the slit membrane that prevents filtration of medium-sized uh, proteins so the three structural components they uh, constitute what we call the filtration membrane if this filtration membrane is affected in case of disease like in case of glomerular nephritis this will result in loss of protein it will result in loss of blood cells and uh, resulting in uh, hematuria resulting in uh, edema because of the loss of protein and so on now let's deal with the proximal convoluted tubule 
uh, this proximal convoluted tubule reabsorbs approximately 75% of the glomerular filtrate. And this high amount or high percentage of absorption uh, that is required from these tubules is reflected on their structure. We can see in this histology slide, which is stained for periodic acid shift, that better reveals a brush border, the presence of uh, microvilli. We can see here, apart of course from this is the glomerulus here, these are glomeruli, but they are surrounded by tubules. You can see two types of tubules. This one with a clear lumen, and you can see these profiles where you can see that there is a clear staining with the pass stain because these profiles, they have a lot of microvilli. So you will expect that in the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule, they have at their apical surface, they have multiple finger-like projections. This is the nucleus here. And these fi multiple finger-like projections, they will increase the surface area for absorption and make the cells more efficient for performing this job, reabsorbing 75% of the glomerular filtrate. And in order to aid in this process, the proximal convoluted tubule has to be long enough. And that's why the proximal convoluted tubule is longer than the distal convoluted tubule. And this is reflected in the section in the fact that we have more profiles of proximal convoluted tubules than profiles of distal convoluted tubule because the distal convoluted tubule is shorter. And so, uh, few profiles will appear in the section in comparison to a longer proximal convoluted tubule. So here again, of course, this preparation is taken from the cortex of the kidney. The reason is that I can see proximal convoluted tubule, distal convoluted tubule, and above all, I can see the glomeruli. This is not possible if the section was taken from the medulla. So this is the Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus and uh, you can see that this is a profile of a distal convoluted tubule because it doesn't, the cells, they don't have a brush border, then the lumen can be clearly defined. So here again, the lumen can be clearly defined and the cells actually are the lining cells. They are cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelium because uh, they are smaller than the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule then you can see that there are more nuclei then there are more cells and you can see here clearly this is a proximal convoluted tubule you can see the brush border that makes the lumen look a little bit narrower than the lumen of the distal convoluted tubule and again you can see that there is a predominance of a proximal convoluted tubule in comparison to the profiles of the distal convoluted tubule because the proximal are longer than the distal. Now, the other part of the tubule is the loop of Henle, and this is a section of the renal medulla. And you can see here that there are multiple profiles of tubes. So here, you cannot say that this is a proximal or distal convoluted tubule. Uh, this is a medulla, I cannot see a glomerulus. This is a loop of Henle. And as I said that the loop of Henle is either a thin limb or a thick limb, so the thick limb of the loop of Henle, like these ones, uh, they are lined by simple cuboidal epithelial cells, while the thin limbs of loop of Henle, like this one, they are uh, lined by uh, simple squamous epithelial uh, cells as opposed to simple cuboidal epithelial uh, cells and the thick segment of the loop of Henle. You cannot differentiate between ascending and descending parts of the of the loop but you can still differentiate between the thick segment and the thin segment of the loop and you can see here that there are other profiles that are also lined with simple squamous epithelial cells but these are not part of the tubule i can see that um, they have blood cells inside them so they are blood vessels they are capillaries they will constitute what we call the vasa recta also i would like to draw your attention that there is no brush border here and uh, these uh, tubules uh, because as I said that these tubules they will concentrate they will secrete as well but most of the reabsorption takes place in the proximal convoluted tubule that's why microvilli which produce the brush border in light microscopy are clear in the proximal convoluted tubules now these are collecting ducts this is mainly in the medulla you can see that they are lined by 
a simple cuboidal epithelial cells. There is no brush border. The cells are a little bit taller than the cells that line the thick limb of the loop of Henle, and the diameter of the lumen is larger. This is another section of the renal medulla, stained by Masson's stain, and this stain will show connective tissue here. Clearly, it will show the connective tissue. But in addition to that, I can still see that uh, there is a, a thick limb of the loop of Henle. These are thick limbs of the loop of Henle. Look at this collecting duct, a large lumen. This is another collecting duct, large lumen and taller cuboidal cells than those of the thick limb of the loop of Henle. Still, I can see the thin limb of the loop of Henle. And also, I can see blood vessels. These, these are... They look like tubes lined by a simple squamous epithelium, but they have blood cells inside. This is a section of the cortex. As you can see, these are renal corpuscles. The tubules here are proximal and distal convolute to the tubule. But in between them, there are regions here. They do not contain glomeruli, and they are solidly made of collecting tubules heading toward the, the medulla. In this uh, longitudinal section, of a kidney showing the gross features. You can see the cortex here, the outermost part, and then you can see the medullary pyramids here. And in between them, there is part, this part of the cortex that is called the medullary ray. So these medullary rays belong to this region of the kidney. It is still a cortex, but there are no glomeruli here. In this section, this is showing the renal papilla. In other words, it is the tip of the pyramid. And as you can see here in this um, section of the kidney, that the tip of the renal pyramid, the papilla, renal papilla, is projecting in a cup-shaped structure, a small cup. Here is another small cup, and this is another small cup here. So these are called the minor calyces, plural for calyx. And then the, these three uh, calyces open into another cup, which is a little bit bigger, so it's called major calyx two or three of these major calyces will constitute what we call the renal pelvis or the pelvis of the ureter that narrows down into the ureter. Also, you can see here that inside the kidney, there is a space and this space is called the renal sinus. And this space is stuffed with fat, as you can see it here, that enters the kidney from the surrounding fat, the perinephric fat. Also, there are a lot of blood vessels and nerves and lymphatics, but mainly it is stuffed with fat. So that's why in this histology section, we can see that there is a lot of adipose tissue here, uh, just outside the minor calyx. This is the minor calyx here, and you can see that the lining of the minor calyx now is, uh, it is lined by transitional epithelium, although it is not that much thick, but it is the beginning of the appearance of the transitional epithelium. This is part of the drainage system of the kidney, the beginning of the drainage system of the kidney that will continue down to the urethra, lined by this transitional epithelium, which is unique to the urinary system. That's why it's also called the urothelium. Facing it here, this is the renal papilla, the tip of the pyramid, and all you can see here are collecting ducts. Now, to conclude our study of the kidney, we will deal with the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which is the structure that serves another function of the renal system, and that is the control of blood pressure and blood volume as well. So, this is done by what we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and as the name indicates, juxtaglomerular means that it is close to the glomerulus of the kidney. You can see it here in this diagram. This is the renal corpuscle and the glomerulus, and the apparatus is here, very close to it. And it consists of two parts. In the section, in the histological section, I can show you only one part of it. And this is the part that is called the macula densa. And these are modified distal convolute to the tubule cells. You can see here, this is a distal convolute to the tubule. The cells here are they act as chemoreceptors. They can sense the concentration of the filtrate inside the distal convolute of the tubule. And the cells are a little bit taller, as you can see here. They are not simple cuboidal epithelial cells. They are 
taller cells, they have more prominent nuclei, and uh, the nuclei are also described as they are close to the luminal surface. So this is the macula densa. It's a modified cells of the distal convoluted tubule. In addition to that, the second part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus are called the juxtaglomerular cells, and these are modified smooth muscle fibers that are uh, present in the afferent arteriole that reaches the renal uh, corpuscle and they act as baroreceptors. They are smooth muscle fibers so they can contract and they are stretched by the pressure of blood inside the uh, afferent arteriole and these they are modified because they contain secretory granules of renin that's going to act through the renin angiotensin uh, mechanism and control the blood pressure and uh, blood volume. I'm not going to go into the details. These are details of physiology that, that you can study them in a physiology textbook. And um, before moving forwards, I would like to remind you that you should not confuse the term juxtaglomerular with what we call a juxtamedullary nephron. There's another term related to the kidney, which is called the juxtamedullary nephron. And these are the nephrons whose glomeruli are close to the medulla in the deep part of the cortex so they are called juxtamedullary nephrons and their loops of henley they dip uh, deeper than the loops of henley of the other uh, nephrons so don't confuse this term juxtaglomerular with juxtamedullary now moving forward to the histology of the excretory passages in these passages there is no more concentration of urine there is no more excretion and that's why they are lined by another type of epithelium which is called the urothelium which lines the minor calyces major calyx the renal pelvis the ureter as well as the urinary bladder and most of the urethra the wall is formed of three layers formed of mucosa which is transitional epithelium then we have muscular layer muscularis formed of smooth muscle fibers and there is an adventitia which is uh, sometimes covered by peritoneum and in this case it is called the serosa. So what is this uh, um, urothelium? What is this uh, transitional epithelium? It is a, a stratified epithelium. Why do we call it transitional? Because the, uh, the cells, the surface cells, uh, change their shape um, depending on the content of the structure that uh, they line. That's why they are distensible. So when relaxed, the surface epithelial cells are cuboidal, and they bulge into the lumen, and they constitute what we call dome-shaped cells. Sometimes they call them umbrella cells. While when the structure, whether it's a ureter or urinary bladder, is distended with urine, as you can see here, the cells of this epithelium, especially the surface epithelial cells, uh, they become flattened. So they undergo a transition and that's why it's called the transitional epithelium. This epithelium is impermeable. There are tight junctions and so there's no modification of urine beyond the renal medulla. The excretory passages, they only allow the transport of urine and its storage. This is a, a high magnification showing the transitional epithelium. You can see here these are the surface epithelial cells, the dome-shaped uh, cells. And also you can see that the epithelium is in multiple layers, stratified epithelium. It is not a simple epithelium. And also you can see the other parts of the wall. I see that the epithelium lies on a lamina propria, which consists of collagen elastic fibers, and as well as uh, fibroblasts, these flattened cells. Also, there are some lymphocytes uh, here. So the um, epithelium and the lamina propria, they will produce what we call the um, mucosa. This is the mucosa. And then there is a muscularis and adventitia. So this is a, the ureter in a horizontal section showing all the three layers. You can see here, the, this is the mucosa, the epithelium lying on uh, lamina propria. And then these, this is the muscularis. You can see muscle fibers in different orientations. You can see them here in this higher magnification better. These are the circularly arranged smooth muscle fibers. And these are the muscle fibers that are longitudinally arranged, bundles, of course, of smooth muscle fibers. 
And um, so the presence of circular and longitudinal muscle fibers, smooth muscle fibers, will allow peristalsis, and this will allow the movement of urine from the pelvis of the kidney, from the calyces to the urinary bladder. And then we have the adventitia, which is mainly formed of connective tissue, contains blood vessels, and in certain places, probably here, it is covered by peritoneum, uh, forming a serosa. This section of the ureter is very characteristic and contraction of the smooth muscle fibers in the wall will create a star-shaped appearance of the lumen because of the folding of the mucosa. Very characteristic for a section in the ureter. Now this section shows the urinary bladder. You can see here the lining epithelium. It's a stratified epithelium, but it is a urothelium and it lies on a lamina propria constituting the mucosa and then we have muscularis look at the muscularis here very thick muscular layer and you can tell that the muscle fibers are in different orientations the muscle fibers here have a special name they are called the detrusor muscle here we have multiple layers and different orientation of smooth muscle fibers because we don't need peristalsis. In peristalsis, you need circular and longitudinal muscle fibers, but here we need mass contraction because when the urinary bladder contract, it should expel the urine to the outside. It does not transport the urine, and that's why we have thick layers of smooth muscle fibers in different orientation. And then we have the adventitia, mainly formed of connective tissue and might be covered with peritoneum, the upper part of the urinary bladder. So this concludes our study of the histology of the urinary system. Thank you very much.